Youth will be served at Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky tonight as the nation's number eight team, the Kentucky Wildcats, host the UIC Flames from the Horizon League. Inside Rupp Arena alongside Dane Bradshaw, I'm Rich Hollenberg. Michaela Vernava will be along later as well. Dane, we said youth will be served. Ken Palm says that Kentucky is the most inexperienced team in the nation, maybe ever, as long as he, he's been tracking that statistic. But little by little, they're growing, they're getting better, and their big man, Nick Richards, is making strides. He had his best game in his young Wildcat career where he was dominant down low in the post. However, with more success, because more attention from opposing teams. And when you look at the UIC Flames, you think of Ty Odiasi, the reigning defensive player of the year from the Horizon League, who will do his best to make life tough on this Kentucky squad down low. Claudia Green, zero and white, brings up the ball in the opening tip. Your officials, Tony Green, Jason Baker, Brian Shea, were underway, and a lob to Hamadou Diallo starts things off for Kentucky. We saw that play run and shoot around. That's option one. They have counters to that, but UIC has to show more resistance, make Kentucky run their offense. Kentucky comes out in a man-to-man. -man. You will see zone from John Calipari tonight. Tarkas Ferguson in the corner. Dominique Matthews knocks down the three-pointer. And if that last name is familiar to Kentucky fans, his older brother Charles spent time here as a Wildcat. Here's Green, another lob. Richards finishes strong. Kentucky comes out strong going inside, and that's been their strength so far this year through their first handful of games this season. Matthews, no, Richards the rebound. Kentucky at their best in transition. And that ball is knocked out of bounds. No foul called, the block by Jordan Blount. Nice lob there by Quad A. Green, getting it up to Diallo. And then when they try to ice the ball screen, which forces the point guard away from the screen. Kentucky has been war working on their counteraction to that. Just textbook by Green with the lob to Richard. Early assist for Claude A. Green, Philly point guard. Great tradition from Philadelphia, great tradition. The point guards here at Kentucky, and Kevin Knox knocks in his first two of the game. Three different scorers for the three buckets by the Kentucky Wildcats, and that's no surprise. Five of their six games, they've had a different leading score. Let's pick your poison right now. They have so many weapons offensively. But this is a UIC team that's going to mix it up on defense. They come out, they pressure, they defend. This time, Odiasi will get switched out on the ball screen on Knox. This is a good cover, good defense. You live with that if you're the Flames. But there's going to be times where you can't put your head down. Kentucky's talent will overwhelm, overwhelm you. There's four in red, Tarkus Ferguson. 6'4", sophomore from out of Belleville, Illinois. And Matthews tries for three again. This time it's too strong. And Green. One on three, turned it over. Here comes their leading scorer. That's Dikembe Dixon, and he has his first two. And he can fill it up if he gets hot, Dean. And if you're the Flames, you have to have guys that can create their own shot against a team like Kentucky, who's so long and UIC has that with multiple players that can do that. Dixon was a unanimous Horizon League Freshman of the Year two years ago. Then he had an ACL injury last year. Before that, he had three 30-point games before the injury. Here's Green with the floater. Green. Claude Green, his last three games coming in, 19 for 29 from the field. So he continues his hot shooting with that bucket. Tried to feed it inside. Green picked it off. Too careless with the basketball for the Flames. You have to value possessions when you go up against this Kentucky team. Green penetrates, lobs. This time it's P.J. Washington who gets fouled and will go to the line and shoot two. John Calipari in his ninth year in the Commonwealth. 24 first-round picks, 31 total. That's 14 more than Duke has produced in that time. This is a factory of talent ever since he came in. And he does, as we mentioned, have his youngest team, which ultimately makes this maybe the toughest coaching job he's had. NBA factory is right, because that's what he does. When you ask Coach Calipari, I asked him the other day in shooting I said, what's your favorite part of this job? And he said, my favorite part is when you look back at the end of the season 
watch and you say, wow, that kid went from that point to there in just 30 games? He loves developing this young talent and getting them to come together. Nobody does it better in the country than Coach Cal. And he is as hands-on a head coach as you will find. Practices, shoot-arounds, he's the only voice in the gym. Two free throws by Washington make it a 10-5 UK lead. Coming in at 5-1 on the season, the only blemish on their schedule, that loss in the Champions Classic to the Kansas Jayhawks. Here's Odiasi, and he's a pro prospect. Shows why there with the quick turnaround. Ty Odiasi, who makes his living on the defensive end with his first two in his 99th career game for UIC tonight. On the curl, Knox, nice touch off the glass. Just so tough. It, you, you've got to try not to allow penetration, but UIC, they do their job. They keep him out of the paint. I mean, look how where he gets to. He gets one foot in the paint. On most teams, you've done your job. But against a guy like Knox, who's so tall and has that wingspan to elevate above you, that's close enough for him. Already eight paint points for Kentucky. Their numbers shooting from beyond the arc way down compared to years past for John Calipari. They will make their hay inside the painted area. There's another UIC turnover, and P.J. Washington will inbounds for Coach Cal. Now Shea Gilgis Alexander has checked in at the point. Look at those numbers. Only 21% of their field goal attempts coming from behind the arc. You mentioned it, Rich. I mean, this is where, what they do. They, their bread is buttered down low. It's not by coincidence, by design. But as you look at that stat, it just shows that they pound it in down low. It's not because they have to. It's just their best option. This is a team of a ton of talent that can shoot the three, but it's inside that's got them a five-point lead at the first break. Well, as we mentioned at the top of the telecast, it was a breakout game for Nick's, Rick, Nick Richards last time out. 25 points, 15 rebounds. With more on his ascension, here's Michaela Vernava. Rich, that career performance by Richards had little to do with what was happening on the court and a lot more to do with watching funny Instagram videos leading up to game time. Get your mind off basketball was the advice Richards got from sports psychologist Bob Rotella. Rotella's been working with Coach Cal for over 25 years since Cal was at UMass. I talked with Rotella last night and he told me he came to Kentucky two weeks ago, spent three days with the team, meeting with players individually and watching practice. And he recognized Richards wasn't playing the same way during games as he did during practice and drills. So he told him to play unconsciously and react instinctively. Kept using the words play free and loose and to just have fun. Great information there, Michaela. And obviously Nick Richards off to a quick start here with two points and a rebound. And a relative newcomer to the sport. He came over from Kingston, Jamaica, and only picked up the sport of basketball at age 14. Well, in his game against Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne decided to double and trap the other bigs, not thinking Ridge was as big, Richards was as big of a threat. And there's a first three-point basket of the night with Gilgis Alexander knocking it down. Shea Gilgis Alexander, number 22, coming off the bench for Coach Cal and thriving so far in that role. He leads the SEC in steals per game with 2.7. Long arms at the top of that defense. What's UK like to do defensively? Uh, you, you talked about the length of G Gilders Alexander, but look at that whole roster on the court right now. Where do you go if you're the UIC Flames right now? And this is the type of hustle that Coach Kyle wants to see. Gilders Alexander can be a glue guy for this team. I mean, he makes that play, then he steps in, takes the three. He's the first guy down the court on defense, first guy back on offense. He was also the first guy on the court today warming up before this game against UIC. And Usually when you have a player that has that much committed and that much invested, it's going to show in game time, and it does so far for Gilgis Alexander. They go inside, Diallo, surrounded by UIC Flame defenders, still gets it to go and has a chance at a three-point play. The Flames have tried to mix it up, showing some zone here. I don't think this is going to be the look they want. If they keep that open paint available for Kentucky, they have a multitude of guys that can fill that sweet spot and get production. Hamadou Diallo, 6'5", redshirt freshman from out of Queens, New York, completes the three-point play. He has an early five, and 
he's kind of the veteran freshman, if you could use that oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. He came here last January, redshirted, thought about going to the pros, came back for his redshirt freshman year, and is now thought of as a highly touted prospect, maybe potentially the best NBA prospect of this group. Yeah, I, I don't think Ken Palm ratings are going to give him credit on the experience there. <laughs> But you're right, he's, he's a veteran for this team in those terms. What NBA scouts like so much about Hami? I think you got to look at, right now it's, it's about potential more than it is production. Yes, he's still giving the Cats plenty to be happy about on the court, but it's the overall upside of this young man and the athleticism. It's not just about the vertical jump. It's what he can do with the ball in his hands. He's best in the open court in his face. Knox. As you saw, Kevin Knox was on that list. You didn't even see Diallo's name, and yet we could barely fit all the names <laughs> on that screen because they have so many high-quality freshmen coming in. And another turnover by UIC. That's number six for them. This is my second game here at Rupp, back-to-back games. It's just so difficult to score on Kentucky. Fort Wayne like to shoot the ball, move it on the perimeter, so try to beat Kentucky from three because you know you can't get a good shot off in, inside. UIC comes in, they're more about penetrating, trying to attack the gaps, but then you get in there and you're amongst the trees. It's going to be a real challenge for SEC teams and teams across the country to win a high-scoring game with Kentucky. Thirteen fifty to go. UK jumping out to a 20 to 7 lead on Steve McLean's UIC Flames in his third season in Chicago. 12th overall as a head coach. Spent five years as an assistant at Indiana under Tom Crean. List not only Crean, but we're going the way back machine for this one. Billy Tubbs has his two biggest coaching influences. He was an assistant at TCU under Billy Tubbs. But before he went over to Chicago, spent those five years as an Indiana assistant. And of course, he was part of that so memorable, such a memorable game back in 2011 in Bloomington when the number one Kentucky Wildcats lost at the buzzer to a Christian Watford buzzer beater. That was the last time those two teams got together in that vaunted rivalry. One of the best media guy type shots in terms of photo ops oh, you could have. Gosh, I mean, that was a scene that nobody will forget. Ten on the shot clock for the Flames. Odiasi got fouled before the ball got swatted out of bounds. That's going to go on 32 and white. Wenyan Gabriel. Well, tomorrow at 8 Eastern, it's the latest SEC feature presented by Belk. We'll showcase all the great stories from the past week across the conference, and you can catch that on your iPhone or iPad using the ESPN app. Ty Odiasi. If there's a hole in his game, it's at the free throw line. A career 53% free throw shooter coming in, though. Nine for ten from the strike before that miss. He's got a 44-inch vertical leap at 6'9", 240. You talk about an NBA body, he's got it. No question about it. And as you mentioned, he's best known as a defender, but still very capable on offense. Going to get an extra crack at it here as Kalia Jones was too early on the box out. And we talk about how young and inexperienced this Kentucky team is. Steve McClain knows what that's like to coach a team like that. Last year, his Flames were the youngest team, most inexperienced in the nation. And to boot, you have a guy like Odiasi, who is the only senior four years at UIC on this team. And there he is with his specialty, the block out of bounds. My goodness, you're not kidding. A lot. A lot of reasons to be optimistic, including this SWAT. Gildress Alexander not used to a big man coming in and saying, get that out of here. And he's just not your typical mid-major guy who can block shots. He was first in the nation in blocks two years ago, fifth in the nation last year. P.J. Washington showing some athleticism. He has four points, and the lead's up to 22 to 8. There's Adi. Instant offense off the bench for Steve McClain. He misses his first shot. They look for the lob. And good get back. That was Godwin Bowen with the defense for the UIC Flames. Those are the type of reads Quade Green's going to have to be better at. Woo. Count that basket. How did that one drop? 
I've seen some bank shots. I'm not sure I've seen one in this direction. Does that go off the corner of the glass? Top of the glass and in. Talk about some English on the ball here inside Rupp Arena. To stay in the game at Rupp, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And sometimes you have to put it that high on the glass considering <laughs> the length of this Kentucky team. It's the only chance you have to not get it blocked, at least get a fingertip on it. There's Godwin Bowen, 6'8", sophomore out of Toronto, Canada. And he completes the three-point play. Burgess Alexander calls his own number and hits the mid-range jumper. Here comes Diallo off the picked off pass to no look, and they wave it off. We're going the other way. And Hami Diallo having some words with the officials saying they were inside the restricted area. No call. It's going to be UIC basketball when we return. 24 11, Cats with the lead. It's a Phil Knight birthday badge. Four teams, two championships, one time only. Let's celebrate PK80 tonight. A distinct feeling of mid to late March happening in very late November with that PK80. Some great games coming up later on. And how about around the SEC, some big time basketball being played. That Alabama game was off the charts. I've never seen anything like it with three players on the floor almost making a comeback against Minnesota. Terrific game with the Florida Gators taking down Gonzaga in two OTs. And Missouri, even though they're missing Michael Porter Jr. in the finals of the Advocare, coming up against West Virginia tonight. Big time storylines there. Let's start with Colin Sexton. I mean, this guy almost single-handedly for Alabama with two other teammates on the court. Can't say single-handedly. Won that game against a ranked Minnesota team. That was like nothing I'd ever seen. Only three players on the court. Just imagine the huddle. You know, they had a couple, they had the bench get ejected from the game. Then they had to get a player to foul out. Another player get hurt. Before you know it, they're five on three for most of the second half. Nice set play by Steve McClain coming out of the timeout. Leads to the Bowen three-pointer. Well, here's what we're talking about. If you didn't hear what happened, in the final 10-41 of the game, Alabama had a play with three players. It was, this wasn't a hockey match. This wasn't a, <laughs> this wasn't a power play. And they outscored Minnesota 30-22 to in that time. We asked Coach Cal earlier if he watched that game or saw any of it. He said, all I'll tell you is, I would have liked to be one of those three players. You get all That's the right. shots you want. I mean, you're licking your chops if you're an offensive player like that. Colin Sexton surely was 40 points for him. Yeah, next time those starters aren't playing as well, Coach Avery Johnson's not going to say, I'm going to sub you out. He's just going to say, I'm just going to take you out. We can do this with three. Four blocks early on from UIC, but they are really suffering in the rebounding edge. Eight rebounds so far for the Cats, only one for the Flames. How do you explain that? Right now, they're just not doing the things to win ball games. And as you mentioned, the rebounding battle, something they're losing on the year anyway, which is a bad sign. But what haunted them last year was the turnover issues that they had. And then coming into this game, already eight. You can't have the eight turnovers, and many of them what we call live ball, meaning the ball didn't go out of bounds. It wasn't a travel. Live ball, meaning Kentucky's taking it and going it the other way in transition. C.J. Washington knocks down the free throw. A little bit of a struggle point for him this season. He came in 11 for 28 from the free throw line. And just to piggyback on your point, Steve, uh, Steve McLean's Flames like to play up-tempo. They want to play downhill, so of course they will have some turnovers, but coming into this game, they had more turnovers, 57, than assists, 56. That's not going to win a lot of ball games. It's a real challenge for an opposing team coming up against Kentucky because you don't want to change the way you do things. I mean, you have your identity as a team, but sometimes that game plan can play into the hands of the Kentucky Wildcats, but bottom line is their game plan isn't to turn the ball over. It's to play fast while still making good decisions. And here we go again with their ninth turnover of the game. 
Now Quade Green checks back in, zero in white. And Shea Gilgis-Alexander goes to the bench. And what a two-headed monster. John Calipari will play them together at times, but you talk about another pick-your-poison type scenario at point guard. An embarrassment of riches here in the Commonwealth. Green, right off the bench. Instant offense from Quade Green, who has four. You mentioned the two-headed monster. Gilders Alexander gave them some terrific minutes, but that's something where Quade Green has the edge. I mean, just something he does a little bit better, something you have to scout for as an opponent, is the pull-up jumper. And there's a rare rebound for Ty Odiasi in the flames. Getting a fresh shot clock, and they promptly turn it over. That's number 10 already, and we're not even halfway through the first half. Make them stop you. Tommy for two. There it is. I thought earlier when he charged, he could have jumped over the opponent. When that lane is that wide open and you are that athletic, make somebody stop you. Hamadou Diallo with an early nine points. Showing why he has NBA scouts drooling. Look at him in the open floor. I don't blame number 10 there in red. Get out of the way when you got that type of jumper coming through. It won't look good on the game film, but man, stand out of the way. He's going to catch somebody at some point this year trying to take a charge. He's going to be jumping over him with the knees and the chest and finishing above the rim. Six foot five, and he's got a 40 plus vert and a six eleven wingspan. That's stuff you can't coach. <laughs> Kentucky in the midst of a 6 0 run in the last minute and four seconds. They're up 16 on the UIC Flames, and this is not a cupcake matchup. These Flames are preseason predicted to finish third and always a tough horizon league last year they went from five wins to 17 wins that was one of the biggest turnarounds and increases in win totals in the country steve mcclain's got this uic program going in the right direction but when kentucky's clicking on all cylinders then they are going to be a tough load to handle for any team in the country they are coming with a half court trap that's blocked by richards and could stick to it in this by Clint Robinson seeing his first action of the night. That was a, a Jamaica on Jamaica matchup. Clint Robinson from Jamaica just like Nick Richards is. Knox lost the control. There's Dixon in the corner, Ferguson. And a fresh 30 for UIC. Body initiated contact that's going to go on Kentucky. That's going to be number two on Quade Green. And now Green stays on the floor with those two fouls, but Shea Gilgis Alexander joins him. A lot of length out there as usual. Sasha Kalia Jones in the post defense. And here comes Green with his head up. Point guard to point guard. And it almost went down. Nice spin move and a left hand finish. That's Marcus Adi. They call him Juice in Chicago. He has his first two. And that's how you're going to have to score against Kentucky. But it must first begin with stops on the defensive end. If you can't get stops, you can't have a transition game. Pinned against the backboard by Odiasi. They've got to push it now before the defense gets set. Get it going. Dixon put his head down. And a traveling violation. That is turnover number 11. I guess if you look at the glass half full, Dan, 11 turnovers and you're only down 12? <laughs> That's how you're going to have to look at it. But it's going to be tough to get up more shots in a game than Kentucky because of the rebounding advantage they have. So you can't just flush possessions down the drain with the turnovers. On the floor now for Kentucky, Gilgis Alexander, Gabriel, Ty Winyard getting his first action tonight. Kevin Knox and Hamadou Diallo. Spin move by Knox. Working on Dixon and he'll go to the line and shoot two. 
Each of these players are going to have their ups and downs, and they've got to have each other's back. But right now in this game, Gilders Alexander is initiating the offense better than Quade Green. And that's something Coach Kyle wants to see better from Green, is getting everybody else going first before yourself. And as you mentioned, what a luxury it is to have when you can sub one guy in, one guy out, and they can both learn from one another because they both have better strengths and some have weaknesses. There's Jared Vanderbilt. When you think about how good this team is right now, they're going to be that much better when that young man gets back from his foot injury. We'll have more on him in a different light coming up in a little bit. Two free throws by Knox gives him six. He's leading the SEC in minutes per game, 35 and a half for the freshman. And Knox grabs the rebound and leads the break. And we have a turnover for Kentucky. That's number seven for the Cats. When we come back, Jared Vanderbilt, multi-sport star. Yes, basketball's not his only specialty. We'll have more on that when we come back. Number eight, Kentucky up 32-18 on UIC. Jared Vanderbilt biding his time before coming back from injury. One of the ways he does that is by playing ping pong. He's the self-proclaimed champ. I decided to test him out myself. So I didn't realize it's lefty on lefty. That, that makes things a little more interesting. Uh, tell me how you picked up the whole thing of uh, ping pong in the first place. Um, really, I just had a gift and we went to it. Yeah. Um, started like my sophomore year. And that's really, that's really every time I played with the dance. See, when we came here, we had one, so we pretty much been playing it since the summertime. Now, you proclaimed yourself as the ping pong champ, but I'm asking around, and there's no verification on that. How did you end up being the champ? Uh, I pretty much beat everybody. <laughs> we, got, we got a witness right here, Jamal Baker. Jamal Baker, Testify can you agree. confirm? I don't agree. Can you confirm? Yeah, well, Shane confirmed it earlier in practice, too. So we'll give you the unofficial title. Uh, I, I know reading, uh, reading up on you from growing up in Houston, you also did a lot of other things in like middle school and high school, you played a lot of instruments. Mm -hmm. What makes you so well-rounded? Do you just have an interest in everything? Um, well, with instruments, I kind of had to play. Well, I went to a magnet school, so uh -huh. I was able to play a type of instrument or act or something like that. So um, I decided to do percussion. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty good experience. What else, uh, what other instruments do you play? Um, just percussion. Just percussion. So you have a drum set anywhere? Uh, I had one <laughs> in middle school, but I uh, really ain't got much time to play no more. They don't allow that in the lodge either, right? Oh, no, no, no. Describe what, I know you, you went through uh, Big Blue Madness. Mm -hmm. I was here for that. Describe what you imagine it's going to be like when you finally take the floor to play in the game. Um, great. I mean, I can't imagine how it'll be my first game, but um, uh, it's going to be a great experience. And hopefully, it's coming soon. <laughs> so You're ready for it, right? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, anticipate. Let's go. Give me your best. Are right, you ready? Ah, I'm the champ of the lodge. I'm going to retire right now. I'm done. Got <laughs> full game. Good job. Dane Bradshaw, that's what's called quitting while you're ahead. <laughs> Hollenberg for the win, I like it. I have never played ping pong against someone with a 7-1 wingspan. <laughs> and I probably never will again. So I'll walk away with that one point and one point only. You're like my older siblings. You go up and then you go inside without giving me a chance to come back, man. <laughs> I hate guys like you. That's seven for Gilgis Alexander. And what a terrific kid Jared Vanderbilt is. Coach Calipari calls him a gatherer. He's got that magnetic personality. And once he gets on the floor, he might end up being the dude everyone one keeps wondering who it's going to turn out to be for Kentucky. Right now, they don't have that guy inside the huddle when the team's not playing as well to get on one another. And that's okay because many of them are trying to figure out what they did wrong on the play before they can make others accountable. And if you do that too early, your teammates won't respect you because they'll say, who are you to tell me? You're not even doing your job. And so it's going to come with time, and Vanderbilt might be that guy. Balance scoring in the first half for the Kentucky Wildcats. Diallo leading the way with 11. Gilgis Alexander has seven. P.J. Washington with six. And Kevin Knox with six. They are up 18 on UIC. Go, 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 go
I love the fact that Cal went to that press out of the timeout. As he told us in shoot around, sometimes he'll go to it just to get the energy and effort going up on the defensive end. Odiasi gets the ball down low and gets it to go. And there's a closer look at Jared Vanderbilt, ranked 35th in the ESPN 100 and multi-sport star, as we heard when we were playing ping pong. He's played percussions. He's a terrific young man and what he brings on the floor is that multi-positional player. I know that Coach Cal is drooling to get him in the center of that zone offense that they'll have to run come conference play. Second lane violation of the half for Kentucky. Kalia Jones and now Washington. It's been the same shooter on Odiasi. He might have a little hesitation before he releases it that's throwing him off. So we saw just a bit of the Coach Cal 2-3 zone there, and Odiasi made him pay for it. Wonder how much longer we'll see it tonight, if, if at all. Odiasi has five. It's a 36-20 UK lead. Coming in ranked eighth in the country. Washington, soft touch. P.J. Washington has eight. So we're seeing that 2-3 zone. What, what is Coach Cal looking to accomplish by going zone? They can still play with some man-to-man -man principles. I, I think right now they know they can stop UIC in man-to-man. -man. They're just working on this because they've seen it be effective. And that's one way. Heck of a shot there, but contested. They have such great length everywhere that even on the perimeter, you give up an open three, so to speak, they put one hand up, and all of a sudden it's a contested shot. Something you're seeing all around college basketball. Even Duke and Mike Krzyzewski have gone to a 2-3 zone, something you don't see very often. There's another easy two off the turnover for Kevin Knox. I can't imagine the message is going to be anything different from a priority standpoint at halftime for UIC, and it's take care of the basketball. Gilgis Alexander trying to weave his way through the UIC defense in transition and got fouled. And right when you able to take the ball away from Kentucky, Washington doesn't give up on the play. Easiest basket Knox will have all season. If you look at Gilgis Alexander at the line, He's an interesting player as you see him on the court, both on TV and in person. He's kind of wiry, has a little bit of an awkwardness to his game and speed. The hair is going everywhere, and at times he can look like maybe he's not in control. But he is. I mean, he's done a really nice job facilitating the offense, getting people involved, and gaining confidence by the day for Coach Kyle at the point guard spot, which offensively is the most important spot in the wild caught offense. He has eight. One for two from the line there. Also has two assists, and most importantly, probably, no turnovers. Coming into tonight, combined, Green and Gilgis Alexander, 40 assists, 29 turnovers. That number probably needs to be a little bit better as the season goes on, too. Usually one at least a two to two and a half to one ratio with your point guard. Here's Robinson. We'll have a UK foul on the floor, and Clint Robinson will go to the line to shoot two. Second foul on PJ Washington. That immediately gets Wenyan Gabriel off the bench. Coach Cal not exactly thrilled with that foul. Robinson knocks down the first to give him three. Here's Gabriel back in the game. Washington to the bench. And this is where Gabriel could be really effective. We've all heard it. What's the number one thing Coach Kyle wants from William Gabriel? It's energy. And we've seen this Kentucky team play the scoreboard at times. And here it is, the last four minutes, Gabriel coming in. Can Kentucky put this team away before half? And energy and excitement from Gabriel will help catapult them to be able to do that. The largest lead was 18, 16 right now. And 
foul on the floor away from the ball, says Tony Green. That's going to send Kevin Knox to the free throw line. Second foul on Dominique Matthews. Kevin Knox, the 6'9 freshman out of Tampa, Florida. Most experts, yourself included, I know, feel like if someone is going to step up and take a lead role out of all these fantastic freshmen, it might very well be number five and one. Appreciate you using the term expert very loosely <laughs> to include me in that. But no, this is this is the toughest matchup on the court. I mean, how do you guard him? USC try to get in him, get him off the screen, but he's so strong, so physical coming off there, he can be unguardable at times. If anything, as an opponent, you just want to try to tempt him to settle for three. Even though he can knock it down, you'd rather him start to get trigger happy from the outside than take you down low. Knox shooting 52% his last four games coming into tonight. He has nine already this evening. Four minutes to go in the first half, 10 on the shot clock. From the elbow, Odiasi, that's really not his game. And here come the Wildcats. Knox. Bowen way off to the left. Offensive rebound by Odiasi, and he gets the put back. Well, you're up 17. They can't stop you down low. And now you give this team just a little bit of life. And it's bad shot selection by Kevin Knox. We just talked about it. Not settling for three. And here's a turnover. Where does this momentum start to keep in? With the Kevin Knox bad shot. Knox pinned that one, but the follow is good. And a timeout called by Coach Cal. Well, UIC clawing around, hanging around. Just energy plays right now. Gabriel should be boxing out stronger down low. And then bad execution on the offensive end. The Flames trying to get a little momentum going into half. Well, you can rest assured UIC will not play in front of 23,000 fans in an atmosphere like Rupp Arena again this season. But bringing this team in, Steve McLean said his team wanted to play at Rupp Arena. Be careful what you wish for. Dane Bradshaw, you know this <laughs> firsthand. I tell you, this is the toughest place to play in the SEC, maybe in the country. And I appreciate you guys going really deep into the archives. Not only did you have to find the game, but then you had to go find some makes. And that's maybe even the even tougher challenge. I'm just surprised. Thank you for finding that. I'm surprised that wasn't black and white video. That yeah, was full I know. color it, video. Yeah, that, that was before we were HD, though. You know, it was before <laughs> HD, so I'm an SD guy. But, um, yeah, we got blown out here several times. Well, did you, get one win. Did what get did you one do win. to prepare for this crowd, this atmosphere? It's unlike anything else. You know, a lot of it is you have to be talking so much and so loud on your communication. But I've always said if, if I was a coach preparing my team for Kentucky, there would be a portion of practice where I told my team to be silent. I know that sounds crazy, but the reason is, is this place can get much louder than your five guys can get loud on the court. And there are gonna be times you just can't hear the coach, you can't hear your teammates, and you can't even hear yourself. So you better be able to execute the game plan even when you're on mute, so to speak, with these Rupp Arena fans. All things being equal, I think Stephen McLean's gotta be happy being down just what is now a 15 point lead. After that, Kevin Knox two-hand slam gives him 11 on the game. Odiasi, men at the rim by Gabriel. Strength on strength. Richards, Gabriel all alone. Rebound by Dixon. And Kyle will live with that shot. It went inside, out, open three. It's no coincidence out of the timeout. Two straight interior passes for the Cats. Ooh, and Kevin Knox went down hard going for that errant pass. And Dikembe Dixon tipped it away. Looks like Knox is okay. And the crowd acknowledges number five. Getting up off the deck. More impressive than him getting off the deck to me is the vision he had. That was a pass. He didn't even want the whistle to blow. Nice vision there by Knox. Taking the blow, getting it to Green. 
Well, Kevin Knox played high school football, but he was a quarterback. <laughs> he didn't take those kind of hits. Well, well that, that was the green jersey they wear back there. I'm sure, the, I'm sure the varsity basketball coach was saying, hey, make sure you got that green jersey on in practice. He gets the Tom Brady treatment. Not against the Flames. Knox has a dozen. Averaging 14.7 points per game. That leads this Wildcats team. Makes them both. He's six for seven from the free throw line tonight. 13 points for Kevin Knox, and he'll take a seat on the bench most likely for the rest of this half with 2.15 to go. Sasha Kalea Jones, number one in white, on for Knox. And they stay in that 2-3 zone, Dave. That 2-3 zone has the man-to-man -man principles, as you've alluded to. Right there, Richards just a couple times needs to be building that wall, playing without putting your hands on the opponent, especially early in the season. The referees are calling it tighter than they will all year long. You see Coach Cal exhorting his troops higher. He wants them out farther. Uh, I guess that has to do with what you call the man principles of a zone. You don't just stay in one particular area. There's a couple challenges when you play zone. One is being able to box out and rebound out of the zone. That's not a problem for Kentucky. They got the link. They got the guys that can cover the ground. The other problem is just becoming complacent, standing around and losing that momentum and energy that you're playing with that I think is the biggest threat to Kentucky playing zone is what it does to their tempo of the game. Odiasi has nine, it's a 15 point Kentucky lead. Knox back in the game and immediately back to work. 15 for Kevin Knox. I think Coach Cal got into him at that last time out. He settled for that one three, which we won't just blow out of proportion. It was one shot. But until they can prove they can stop you down low, Kevin Knox, just keep going out. Bowen with a very little bit of airspace knocks down a tough jumper. Godwin Bowen in double digits with 10. They're not playing their best basketball, but USC has a lot to look forward to. Some young talent on this team. 12-game improvement last year with four of their five starters returning, most of which are young guys. And they don't have the threat of Kentucky has it, having to replace them to the NBA team. Big to big passing, easy two for Sasha Kalia Jones. He was the youngest on this roster a year ago, came back for his sophomore year, now he's the elder statesman. 45 seconds in the first half. Here's Matthews from the corner. Odiasi, another rebound. The putback doesn't go, and a rebound for Knox. Thirty seconds left. Seventeen point Kentucky lead. Ten on the shot clock. Here's Gilgis Alexander, and he'll have a chance at a three-point play. You're right. Shane Gilgis Alexander has almost that Magic Johnson feel, where it looks like he's playing at a slower speed. <laughs> he than he is. is, and usually you got to worry about freshmen slowing down. The game gets too fast for him. For Gilgis Alexander. He's got a terrific tempo, terrific feel for the game. I like seeing him and Quade Green in here together. I'm not saying this is permanent, but right now they've got Gilgis Alexander playing on the ball with Quade Green coming off, giving Green shooting ability. That's what we call high-level problems, Dan. <laughs> That's correct. Can't complete the three-point play. Gilgis Alexander with 10. As we wind down the seconds in the first half, an impressive performance from the Wildcats, putting up 52 points. And the foul is going to go on Gilgis Alexander with only 2.4 left in the half. And as you would imagine, John Calipari not very pleased. Bowen will go to the line and shoot. Get in there. 
And he hits the front end of the one and one, giving him 11 points. And Bowen hits them both. Good first half for Godwin Bowen, averaging nine and a half a game. He already has 12. He got it off. But it's off to the side for Kevin Knox, who leads all scorers with 15 points. And the 52 scored by the Cats, Dane, the most they've scored in a half this season. The Flames could do nothing to stop them, and they only hurt themselves even more with the turnover issues they had against this Kentucky team. Let's go to Michaela with Coach Cap. Coach, you talked today at practice about not wanting Kevin Knox to settle for threes and to use his size. How would you assess his performance here in the first half? I thought he did good. We still, you got to have a whole team playing for each other, not themselves. And what's happening is we're breaking off stuff. We're not even looking to screen because the guy screening is looking at the ball because he wants the ball. Those kind of plays, defensively rebounding the ball. We, we've got a young team, and that's the kind of stuff. I'll give you another example. You're the point guard. Sprint it. You don't jog it up. You sprint it up and then look to throw ahead. So we got a lot of stuff that we just got to tighten up. Comfortable lead here heading into the half. What would you like to see from the team in the another next half? 20 minutes, which we haven't done this year yet. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Michaela. Our halftime score, UK up 52-35 on the UIC Flames. We'll be back with our halftime report right after this. Back in the Commonwealth, Lexington, Kentucky, you're looking at the square, and it's a 52-35 Kentucky lead. The eighth-ranked Wildcats scoring the most points in a half this season against the UIC Flames. Inside Rupp Arena alongside Dane Bradshaw, I'm Rich Hollenberg. This is the Halftime Report on SEC Network. And this is going to be a season in SEC basketball that is unlike any season we've seen in the recent past. Why? Because Kentucky is going to be right up there with the best of them. But Florida and Texas A&M, to name just a couple, should contend for the title this year. The depth of the league is very impressive, but you're right. you got to look to the top of the league where you see Final Four type opponent or type competition You've mentioned it, Florida, Texas A&M, Kentucky. Many years it's, okay, Kentucky's going to win. Who's in the battle for second place and third place? But Kentucky's going to have their hands full this year, specifically with the Gators and the Aggies. Let's take a look at why you think that could be the case, because there are some tangible reasons, along with some intangible ones, why those two teams, specifically the Aggies and the Gators, can compete. As we sit here in late November, I've got the Aggies as the best team in the SEC right now today because of all the items you see there mentioned. Experience will come along the way for Kentucky as these young guys get more and more experience. And then post play for Florida, the missing piece, John Igbunu will be coming back from his injury later in the season. But right now, the Aggies have everything Kentucky has, and they have a couple things they don't have. When you talk about four players returning from last year that averaged 10 points or more, but Florida right now, they've got the best win on the year when you talk about the Gonzaga win and another opportunity tonight against Duke. And Texas A&M to start off the season had a super impressive win. Without a couple of their studs, they still came back and beat West Virginia. Uh, these are two teams that you're going to hear a lot from, not only in conference play, but in postseason as well. And as much as I like the bigs for A&M, when you talk about Williams and Tyler Davis down low, when it comes March, I would rather have dominant perimeter play than post play. It's much tougher to take a guard out of the game than it is a big man, and that's where I think Kentucky can have an edge going down. When you talk about Gilders Alexander, Kevin Knox, as big as he is, you got to look at him like a guard. Well, here's a couple of key games coming up. Missouri being in the mix as well. They're taking on West Virginia in the Advocare later tonight. The Wooden Legacy, the PK-80, of course, two brackets full of Blue Bloods, North Carolina, Michigan State, followed by Duke and the aforementioned Florida Gators. We'll be back with more on the Halftime Report. UK leads it 52-35 from Rupp. Number eight, Kentucky, 52. The USC Flames from the Horizon League, 35. We're at halftime on the SEC Network. Some Sunday night basketball from Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky at courtside with Dane Bradshaw. I'm Rich Hollenberg. We wonder coming in, and when I say we, I mean collectively the media wondered coming in, 
who of this terrific crop of freshmen was going to step up and take a leadership role, be called what we would say the dude in college hoops. And the consensus vote goes to Kevin Knox. Tonight he's proven that, 15 points already in the first half. Well, and it makes his life easier when guys like Nick Richards last game had a breakout game. Then the defense has more people to focus on, and now you can't give as much attention to Kevin Knox as you probably should. This is a guy, whenever he's got even a foot in the paint, it is over for you. He's got the mid-range game, but teams just can't stop him. And, yes, we've seen him settle for a few threes, 0 for 3 in that category. But if I'm Coach Kyle, it's like, hey, I know you can shoot the three. You don't have to prove it to me. Get your butt down low or make them stop your drive and then shoot the three as the backup plan. Yeah, the Kentucky Wildcats, John Calipari, certainly playing to their strengths, keeping the ball inside, not necessarily settling for three-pointers. They've only attempted five three-pointers so far tonight. Uh, Hamadou Diallo, another top NBA prospect, a redshirt freshman, also in double digits with 11. And they want him to get his confidence up because he hasn't played up to his expectations so far this year. When you have a supreme athlete like Diallo, one way to get his confidence up is crowd-pleasing type dunks. I mean, he was a guy, he ends up getting the alley-oop there. He probably could have thrown that one down. But he was all over the place in the first half, especially in getting the heart of the zone. And then that was the throwdown we mentioned earlier. And here he is again, just elevating of the defense. He really had success. I thought they did a good job intentionally trying to find him in that zone, get him involved. He's so good, but he's a guy that can get lost if you don't call set plays for him. Cal did a nice job keeping him involved. Backup point guard Godwin Bowen and the number one shot blocker in the nation, Ty Odiasi with 21 points combined. But Kentucky has really capitalized on the Flames' turnovers. 12 turnovers, 20 points for the Kentucky Wildcats, so they're using their defense to turn it into offense. The Flames struggled with turnovers last year, and here tonight, three assists, 12 turnovers, that's not going to get it done in Rupp Arena, especially a team that can go and push it so fast in transition. All right, when we come back, we will have more from the halftime report, and we are set for second half play as the Kentucky Wildcats look to get their sixth win on the season. They lead it by 17 over UIC, 52-35. It's a Phil Knight birthday bash. Four teams, two championships, one time only. Let's celebrate PK-80 tonight. Alongside Dane Bradshaw and Michaela Vernava, I'm Rich Hollenberg. We are in Rupp Arena for the second half action between the Wildcats and the Flames of UIC, but it has been quite the week for college hoops in late November. The Advocare Invitational wrapping up later tonight at 9.30. Missouri without Michael Porter Jr. taking on the 23rd ranked West Virginia Mountaineers. We have the Wooden Legacy on the West Coast and then of course the PK-80 that you just heard about. It's like a Final Four. North Carolina, Michigan State, Duke, and Florida. But already, Dane, the SEC has had some signature wins in the non-conference. They've not only met preseason expectations, they've exceeded them. I mean, the only question mark is Missouri, who's handled it well without Michael Porter Jr., and that's something you can't control with the injury. I got to tell you, though, if Florida's going to win, they're going to have to control the boards against Duke. Duke gets 44% of their misses. They must control the glass if the SEC is going to get a big-time win there. Congrats to Mark Fox on that nice win over Jock Londale and St. Mary's. And Arkansas came back from taking it on the chin at UCon against uh, North Carolina and really manhandled UConn earlier today. And then you look at the bottom of the league, supposedly the bottom. Tennessee has a really nice outing in the Bahamas as well, getting a win over Purdue, playing them well against Villanova. So this is a league right now that it's going to be, it, everybody always says anybody can beat anybody on any given night, but it's true this year. Well, this Kentucky team can shoot threes. John Calipari has assured us of that, but they are certainly playing to their strength. We told you this at the top of the telecast. Coming in this season, only 21% of their field goal attempts have been from beyond the arc. Tonight, they've only attempted five, made one of them. It's a small sample size still being early in the season, but it just seemed to me as watching film and watching them practice that it was more than a coincidence. This is a point of emphasis by Coach. Cal and they were doing a terrific job executing that game plan and we'll see how teams choose to defend them later on in the season. Shea Gilgis Alexander starting the second half whereas Quade Green the point guard started the first half. Now I think that's the right call continue that battle that competition at point guard it's not that Quade Green has done anything terribly wrong but Gilgis Alexander is just playing really well running this offense. Michael Diggins, number two in red. With one on the shot clock, Dixon didn't recognize it, and it's a shot clock violation. 
that's a pretty decent first defensive possession for John Calipari. Yeah, and UIC's got to be frustrated. I mean, one time in the first half, they come out of a timeout and they get a 10-second violation. Then they come out of halftime and they're not able to get a shot off. And yes, you have to credit the defense of Kentucky, but again, when you're trying to limit your turnovers, especially with a clean slate in the second half, you got to be better. There's Diallo starting off the second half. He has 13. When teams play zone against Kentucky, they better find Diallo because he's found that sweet spot right there at the free throw line. He goes to work. Diggins misses the jumper. And P.J. Washington comes away with that. They work it inside. Nick Richards, who had a quiet first half, comes up short on the turnaround hook with the left hand. Here's the lob for Odiasi. And Kentucky getting a little taste of their own medicine on that one. I agree. You took the words out of my mouth, man. I got nothing to add. The lead remains 17. About a minute and a half gone by in the, in the second half. Here's Richards this time on the right block. And with his strong hand, Nick Richards gets that one to go. He has four. And as well as he played last game, and you see the bucket there, Kentucky fans, don't look for him to be just a primary option right now at this stage in his career. He's still learning, developing, getting a feel for down low, of when to take it, how to do an up and under move, and so forth. <laughs> nice follow by Clint Robinson. Back-to-back -back dunks on consecutive possessions for UIC. And the foul on the floor with 17.49 to go. 56-39, UK with the lead. Michaela has more on what Coach Cal told his team coming out of the locker room. Guys, Quad A Green on the bench right now in the locker room. They reviewed the film of that turnover he made early in the first half. And Coach Cal said that as a point guard, he needs to see that and know that that's not there. He did say Kevin Knox has done well in the post. He's happy with what he was able to do. He challenged the team to do better rebounding in this half and also to put a full 40 minutes together tonight. He said how they've had some strong first halves this season, but let up on the gas in the second. He wants them to put a full 40 together tonight. Thanks, Michaela. To your point, Kentucky had a, just a 17-14 rebounding edge, but you remember at the beginning of the game, it was about a 9-1 advance. And most of that damage was done on the defensive side, where they were able to give the Flames extra opportunities with the offensive rebound. And another two for the Flames. Godwin Bowen leads the scores for the Flames with 14. Three consecutive trips down the floor on offense for UIC. Three consecutive buckets. One thing to watch for as we see him doing another lob attempt to Richards is, is Gabriel's already in the game. And why is he already in the game? Because P.J. Washington didn't box out the way Coach Calvin. When I look at Washington, when I see him play with the toughness, energy, when he's into it, I say, man, that's the baddest dude in the SEC. But then at times you forget he's in the game when you're watching. And so with, when Coach Cal talks about that full 40 minutes, that's one player in particular that I think could do a better job. And when he does, watch out. Push off. Give me that. Offensive foul on Gilgis Alexander. Well, Dean, UIC, the offense has come to play in the second half. Yeah, throw it up there at the rim. Looked like they were up at uh, Kentucky's practice. They got the athletes, they got the guys. The problem so far has just been when they get to the rack, making good decisions and not turning the ball over. Three minutes gone by, second half. UK, a 16-point lead over the UIC Flames from the Horizon League. Knocked out of bounds by Philea Jones, 15 on the shot clock. Call for the travel. One guy the Flames could really use to help them get a comeback. Assistant coach, D. Brown, former Illinois star. You talk about a guy that can recruit. You're looking at him, man. 
Everybody in Chicago knows that guy. Everybody in the country that's followed basketball knows that guy. He's a teammate of mine at the Nike camp. I joked with him earlier today. I said, yeah, you had a little bit longer career. You, you, you got a little bit more attention at those camps than I did. But, man, he's the same guy, same dude, passionate about this program. 12 now for Gilgis Alexander. What a fun guy to talk to. Got to spend some time with him at practice yesterday. He wants to be a head coach. So this is the first stop on what promises to be a long journey for D. Brown, part of that sensational team back in 2005, that Illini team that went all the way to the national championship game. Luke, only Luke to lose Darren Williams, to man. North Carolina in the finals. You got When you think of him, you think of great player, but terrific leader. I mean, this guy's energy. I've been in the huddle with him, albeit in a summer league type setting. But when you can lead even in those conditions, you can lead anywhere. Only lost one game at home his entire career, only 23 times for his career. And it was interesting to me what he said earlier. I mean, he says it was so passionate. He goes, I, you know, trying to get through to our team. He said, back when we were playing, it was like, man, they were going to be nice. We couldn't make some shots. But all that did was make us slap the floor and say, you know what? If we're off tonight, you're going to be off too. Nobody's scoring on us. And if we've got to win 48-46, we're going to do it. But it was fun to listen to him. You talked about he wants to be a head coach one day, and I, I no, no uh, doubts that he will. But you know, he got in administration. Thought about maybe trying to become an athletic director. There's then he gets into player Friday development, Green. and now he's on the assistant side, where he can be on the court, uh, court making his best impact as a coach. Only the second three-pointer of the game for Kentucky. And there's another easy bucket at the other end by Dikembe Dixon, who now has six. Brown had a long, productive career overseas playing professionally. Great look by Green, but he couldn't handle it. Sasha Kalia Jones missed a bunny when it went off his hands. 62-45, UK with the lead, 15-36 to go. Sixty-two forty-five. UK leads with 15.36 to go inside Rupp Arena. Coming up Wednesday at 10 Eastern, the SEC Network grants you an all-access pass to Auburn football for their game this past Saturday against Alabama. You'll get never-before-seen footage and sounds from pregame to postgame. SEC Inside, presented by Regions Bank, also streaming live on the ESPN app. I'm sure a lot of people will watch that. I just don't think a lot of Crimson Tide fans will watch that. And you and I were their partner on Friday night for <laughs> Auburn basketball. And this is what happens after Auburn wins one of the most important games in Iron Bowl history. The entire area of Toomer's Corner completely rolled by the trees and the toilet paper. My favorite part of this picture is that tree, uh, the first tree to your left as you look at the picture, there was that right there. There's a little small sign that says, do not roll. I guess the tree's still <laughs> immature, they're still watching it grow. And to think that that would have had an impact on these students rolling that tree. No truth to the rumors that you hung around after our game and, and helped those <laughs> students from Auburn roll the trees. There's Knox three point oh, oh. by Richards. Sometimes your best offense is go get those misses. <laughs> Dixon. They needed a huge second half from the Kembe Dixon if they want to get themselves back in this game. Uh, even when Kentucky misses, that's just the first problem to deal with. How are you going to get the defensive rebound with the trees like that? And that's that's where Richards, I think, is primarily going to get his baskets. Off spoon fees down low, offensive rebounds more than traditional post-up plays for him. There's a three-pointer by Godwin Bowen. He played good off He has a game-high 17 tonight. Two off his career high. Godwin Bowen, the 5'11 sophomore out of Toronto. And Richards starting to heat up. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. We call those spoon feeds. Point guard gets in the lane and just drops it off. Keep it up high, put it in. Nothing fancy about it at all. Gildress Alexander, re reason he's getting the nod in the second half, plays like this, running the offense. Now Shea will go to the bench with three fouls. And Hamadou Diallo checks in in his stead. Richards came in 11 for 14 from the free throw line. And Flames pushing the offense with Dikembe Dixon, taking it the length of the floor. He gets fouled and will go to the line and shoot two. 
Dikembe Dixon, one of six underclassmen in the nation, Dane, nominated for the Julius Irving Award, given to the nation's best small forward. That's the kind of company that he keeps. Well, you gotta be a pretty good player when you only played 10 games last year due to injury, and you're still picked to be on the first team all Horizon League. I mean, this is a guy that was a freshman of the year, then comes back for his sophomore campaign where he was granted a red shirt after getting injured. But a big reason why people are excited about this Flames program, talent like this, that's going to be around for a while. Dixon missed them both. And the Chick-fil-A promo continues to have success. It's not that I did more research than you, Rich. I was just here last <laughs> game. But they missed two in a row in the second half. Free Chick-fil-A for everyone. There's Green with another three. He has two of those this half. Ten on the game. Quade Green, tough, gritty, Philly point guard. There have been a lot of those throughout basketball history. Led his high school Newman Gretti to four straight state titles. Quade Green averaging 11.7 points a game. The best free throw shooter so far this season. And there's Green. His last three games is five for eight from three-point range. So when you talk about this team not necessarily shooting a lot of three-pointers, if there is one person who's going to do it, it might be zero and white. And he's continuing a tradition. We could have filled this screen with <laughs> dozens of guys. We focused on three point guards since Quade is a point guard. But Earl Monroe from way back has his number retired by two different NBA teams, the Knicks and the then Baltimore Bullets. Of course, Pooh Richardson had a great career with UCLA. And then now contemporary Kyle Lowry with the Toronto Raptors, all from the city of brotherly love. Lowry certainly comes to mind in recent memory. Getting to watch him live and in person. Then had a, has a terrific career going with the Raptors. A nice lob by Quade Green. Now, to continue on, on the subject with him, you, you mentioned the amazing um, story of him having four straight titles. And this is the challenge with young guys at Kentucky, as we've heard Cal talk about too. But it's not that that was easy for him, but how much adversity have you really faced in your career? Nothing like really somewhat getting benched here in the second half. These are things that are part of the growth and maturation process for these brilliant, talented guards like Quade Green and how they go from really being a good, talented player to an NBA draft pick type player within a year many times. Michael Kidd Gil Gilchrist, a familiar name to Kentucky faithful now playing in the NBA. He's from the Philadelphia area. You can go on and on with the legacy that Philadelphia Hoops has going from high school to then college and certainly success in the NBA game. And that's the trajectory that Quade Green is on as well. Speaking of trajectory, you know, I'm, I'm from Memphis, but I grew up a diehard Philadelphia Eagles fan. How about my birds? He's soaring right now. Carson Wentz. I see you shaking your head like. I, I just like, find out things about you. Yeah. Every time I work your, your dad's from New Jersey, yeah, South Jersey. Point. Yeah. I guess that's the connection. I, huh? I grew up a big Cunningham fan, man. I just thought he was the coolest quarterback, and here we are, and suffered through a lot of losses and disappointment. But Carson Wentz got my guys rolling right now. He's certainly going to get some consideration for MVP as they keep rolling. They had a big win today against the Chicago Bears. Did the Philadelphia Eagles? First team to 10 wins in the NFL. And Gilgis Alexander back on the floor as Hami Diallo will take a seat. So Gilgis Alexander playing with three fouls. And he's got the toughest cover on the floor in Dikembe Dixon, who goes up and under. Talk about an athlete right there. Refusing the ball screen, going left, finishing on the other side of the basket. Use the rim as your protector when you have a shot block. Richards, the rebound to Dixon. Kentucky hasn't quite pulled away, but they've maintained their lead for the most part that they had at halftime in the second half. Blocked by Richards out of bounds. Again, 
refused the ball screen that was coming up for it. Take it straight line drive to the left. Gilbert Alexander, you got to move your feet quicker when you got that type of athlete coming at you. Kemby Dixon, interestingly enough, went to high school in the state of Kentucky. Actually played at four high schools before he went off to college, but a couple of years was here in the Commonwealth. Here's the bounce pass for P.J. Washington. Just when I thought he might have given it to the big man a little bit too early. I forgot P.J. Washington to just about take it from the free throw line. Yes. A 20 point lead. The largest lead for the Cats tonight has been 21. And now they're up 72 52, coming up on 12 and a half to go. If you're going to attack the basket as the opposing team, you better make sure somebody's back. Because once you miss, the Cats are off to the races. Gilders Alexander, nice little traditional bounce pass. Don't see many of those from Kentucky. It's usually it's lobbed up at the rim, but there's a time for everything. It's those types of plays that you hope, even in a 20-point game, gets Washington going a little bit, gets that motor running. Because when he has it, he's unstoppable. Five Cats in double figures already. Still have more than 12 minutes to go in this game. Maria Jones posting up on Robinson. Lost it off the double team. And picked off again. Adi, little Euro step from Marcus Adi can't go. And Kalia Jones on the bottom of the pile. They call a foul or a jump ball on that. That was a jump ball. It'll be possession arrow to UK. Quite a green sees the open man that sometimes it's just not your night. Force it a little bit. But I like the way Coach Kyle's kept him in the game. You've sent your message to the young player. Now it's the balance of he knows what he's done wrong, but still keep his confidence with that constructive criticism without pulling him every time he makes a Ten points, five rebounds, but four turnovers for Quade Green tonight. Thought about it, pulled the trigger. That's his first miss from three-point range, but P.J. Washington got it to go and will have a chance at three the hard way. 12 points for P.J. Washington. He'll have a chance to make it 13. One way to get buckets for P.J. Washington. Crash the offensive glass. Thought he was going to get home, but got the and one instead. Kentucky up big. This is the seventh game in the last 17 days for the Kentucky Wildcats as they lead UIC 74-52 with 11.45 to go. And Dane, I think if you ask the players, they would all to a man tell you they wish they could keep playing at this clip. <laughs> but unfortunately for them, in December, it's basically one game per week. And that means Camp Cal is going to happen right. in December, <laughs> where it's like boot camp yeah. for these players. But they have a tough schedule against some mid-majors. Harvard is going to be good again. Virginia Tech out of the ACC. A rematch with UCLA, who they lost to last year. And the same could be said against Louisville, who they lost to by three as well. I remember those days when school was out for Christmas break. That means there's no limit on how many hours the coach can threaten you to stay there <laughs> all day long. And Camp Cal is going to do it. But I really love the way their schedules lined up. They go with so many games in a row in November against good opponents. But you get exposed with how teams are going to play you with different matchups, what your weaknesses are, your strengths. And then as the competition increases in December, you get more practice time to work on those specific things to play against the better competition. Out of time out, Washington completes three-point play. He has 13. And Camp Cal is not just boot camp. To hear him describe it and his assistant coaches, it's nonstop practice, it's defensive drills, it's all the things the kids hate. But then he brings them to his house, they have big meals, they sleep over. So it is a little bit like summer camp meets boot camp. Yeah. But one thing they're going to have to do is stop the straight line drives. I mean, that's Dixon going straight to his left with no resistance whatsoever. Move your feet, cut him off. 
But you're right, it's an opportunity for many of these guys to get a feel for what an NBA schedule is like. When you don't have the classes and you're practicing two times a day, how are you going to get your extra shots up? Because it's not just free time to play more video games. I mean, this is free time to work on your craft. How are you going to eat and sleep and really perfect your game as best you can as you head into conference play in the SEC? Moments ago, you saw Cal. Speaking with P.J. Washington, who was whistled for his third foul, there's a lot of teaching going on in game, especially when you're up as big as U.K. is. How do you lose him? Kevin Knox, best player on the court, just sneaks behind the defense, and nice find by Green. Green picking up three-quarter court on Marcus Otter. Adi with the miss, or that was Matthews with the miss, and Odiasi with the follow slam. He is 13. Good four or five times down the last several possessions. Just straight line drives on that left side. Extra pass. Diallo underneath. Good ball moving by the catch that side down. And good moving without the ball, just as importantly with Diallo. Don't stand there. When the big man gets double teamed, if you stand on the perimeter, you're not going to get it. But if you move without the basketball the way Diallo does, that's how you become a leading scorer in the SEC. There's a foul called away from the ball that's going to send Kevin Knox to the free throw line. Check that. It's going to be Kentucky ball out of bounds. No free throws from Knox. Coming up on 10 minutes gone by in the first half. It's a 25 point UK lead. The floater. And that's what has NBA scouts drooling. It's just so tough. I mean, Kentucky's goal is there's another straight line drive to the left. Better job by Washington. But Kentucky's goal offensively when they get in that dribble drive is to get to the SEC logo in the paint. But the great thing is with Knox, if he can't get all the way to the SEC just outside of it, that's close enough. Jump up, rise over the defender, and put it in. Nick Richards comes in. P.J. Washington to the bench. Wendell Gabriel checks in as well. And Sasha Kalia Jones will take a seat. That ball goes out of bounds. And it'll be Kentucky basketball. Well, Kevin Knox already matching his career high tonight with 20 points so far. But it's been a balanced scoring attack for these Cats. Five players in double figures. That's the unique thing. Is you mentioned the key word there being balanced. And they have to learn to accept that each night isn't going to be their night. And one night it's going to be Richards. And as he takes attention away from the defense, Knox steps up. And I'm sure next game the focus will be on Knox and other guys will get their career tight. From the elbow, pretty touch by Kevin Knox. He has 22. That's his career high. And the lead is ballooned to 29. Matthews hey. knocks down the three. three point. Dominique Matthews opened the scoring for UIC with a three-pointer. That three-pointer with 9.45 to go in the second half is his second bucket of the game. It's been all Kentucky cruising to victory number six. They're up 83-57. Nine forty-five to go. Kentucky up big on UIC, and with this being Thanksgiving weekend, the idea of giving back to your community not lost on Coach Calipari. Here's Michaela with more on that. Rich, we know Coach Cal has his hands full trying to teach these young Wildcats, and one thing he's trying to instill in them is to be selfless. He says that that makes for the best type of teammate because it translates to on the court action. So they went to serve food at the Salvation Army, something they do annually on Thanksgiving. And after that, the players and some of their family members all gathered at the Calipari's household. So it seems like it was a good holiday for the Wildcats. I'm sure it was, Michaela. And one thing from talking to Coach Cal, especially around this time of year, Dane, is he's trying to coach these young men to be professionals in the NBA, but to also be professionals in life. And what they have to understand is that he's teaching them is what a privilege it is to wear the blue and white. And he understands what a privilege it is to be on the platform as the head coach. And that comes with responsibility, not just in your office watching film or on the practice court, but it's in the community. As we see a pretty filled arena here tonight, 
for an Illinois-Chicago team. Not too many people leaving either <laughs> with the 26-point game. Yeah, you're pretty much assured of a capacity crowd every night here inside Rupp Arena. 23,000-plus on hand. 83-57 lead. Rich Hollenberg, Dane Bradshaw, Michaela Vernava bringing you the action on the SEC network. And one thing you could say about this Kentucky offense is they haven't been setting the world on fire. Coming in, they're 12th in the conference and scoring 73 and a half a game. That number is going to go up after tonight's performance. And they've been able to control tempo at times. Again, I think a lot of that is keeping the offense with the 15 feet in. They're shooting such a high percentage from two. No reason to force too many threes. And they've faced a whole different type of game strategies against them from the opposition. You see an Illinois Chicago team, UIC, that's committed to driving in at and at them. We've seen Fort Wayne that wants to shoot threes. Vermont kept the tempo, and of course, Kansas. So they've seen all types of matchups in this short sample size in November, about as much as you possibly can for a young team. 19 turnovers now for Steve McLean's UIC Flames compared to only 11 for the U UK uh, Wildcats. And that's going to be something that obviously Coach Cal will pick apart those 11 turnovers, but 11 is a pretty good number. Especially when the game can get out of hand, get a little bit sloppy. I think they've done a good job of keeping attention to detail um, despite the scoreboard, something that he's tried to work on them with and, and get 40 minutes to play out of them. I think he's getting that tonight. It won't be perfect, but that will be. Watch out. <laughs> Another assist for Quade Green and 17 for Hamadou Diallo. UK with 8.45 to go in this game has already matched their season high point total of 86. Diassi, strong finish at the other end. 15 for Tyler Diassi. Yeah. Well, as we discuss the different styles of play, I think one thing teams are going to learn is you can't do a lot of quick shots against this Kentucky team. They get out and go. That's too easy for Claudia Green, who now has a dozen. Green with 12 points, four rebounds, or five rebounds, and four assists tonight. Matthews, no. Green. Grabbing rebound number six. And that ball goes out of bounds, but Coach Cal likes what he sees. Effort on display from the Baby Cats. Quade Green pushes up the court. Great bounce pass. Watch out, Diallo. Coming through your television. Best vertical in the NBA combine. Let's see it one more time. Take us to break, Diallo. It's a Phil Knight birthday badge. Four teams, two championships, one time only. Let's celebrate PK-80 tonight. There will be celebrating in the great Northwest. Number one Duke taking on number seven Florida in the nightcap of the PK-80. And obviously Florida off to a terrific start, ranked seventh in the country. They took down these Wildcats one year ago. But this year, they might be even better than they were last year, That a team that made it to the Elite Eight. When you look at the top three teams in the SEC, they have it all. I mean, look at all the boxes they check. Kentucky lacks a little bit of experience right now, something they'll gain throughout the course of the year. Florida post play, something they're missing somewhat because of Johnny Booney still out with an injury. That's why I think A&M right now in late November is the top team because they have everything those other teams have except they have something they don't have, and that's returning starters, four guys that averaged double figures last year. But I will add to that to hedge my bet a little bit so these Kentucky fans don't get too mad at me. Well, I was going to say, as basically, much <laughs> what I'm understanding now is that you're giving the Kentucky Wildcats some big-time bulletin board material. Should I go ahead and say this is my last game at Rupp Arena at <laughs> the SEC Network? But Something to I, shoot for. As much as I like the interior of Texas A&M, come March, I would much rather have a dominant perimeter play than inside. It's just harder to take away guards than it is post from the game. Well, Kentucky let's, certainly let's, has that luxury with yeah, Knox and the guards. And let's string that conversation out because we've talked a couple of times tonight about the lack of three-point shooting. Not that it's poor three-point shooting, yeah. but the number of attempts way down from beyond the arc for Coach Cal. Do you anticipate that changing as the season goes on? It's not that they can't shoot the three. It's that they don't have to. 
When at that said, they're going to face some big, long teams. They're going to force them to shoot the three and make them beat them from the perimeter. So that's yet to be seen. And if I'm an opposing team, that's what I have to try to do against Kentucky because they're just too good from 15 feet and in. Well, there's a look again. This season, just 21% of John Calipari's Wildcats three uh, field goal attempts have become three-point field goal attempts. That's compared to an average of 30% in his first eight seasons here in Lexington. <laughs> and tonight is a perfect example. Three for nine from downtown, but they have 48 paint points. And until somebody stops it, why well, stay away from it? Kevin Knox has a career high with 23, and now Hamadou Diallo has a career high with 19. And it's 90 to 59 coming up on seven minutes to go. Dixon. There's a foul before the shot on Dikembe Dixon. That's going to go on Kevin Knox's first foul. And Dikembe Dixon with eight Dixon points, steps to the line. Came in averaging 14.3 per game. That leads this Flames team. Well, tomorrow at 7 Eastern, we'll have Thinking Out Loud, presented by Regions Bank with Greg McElroy and Marcus Spears. They'll talk football, and they want your participation via social media and live call-ins throughout the show. I imagine they'll have something to say about the Iron Bowl. I imagine they'll have something to say about the Tennessee head coaching job, which at last check is still undecided. DJ Washington with another two. He has 15. This coaching carousel in SEC football is a reality show. And I'm glad we have those two guys to cover it on Thinking Out Loud. That's where I'm tuning in if I want to get the, the insight and perspective from those guys. Dan Mullen, rumored to be the leader in the clubhouse right now for the Florida job. And I'm being told by our crack production staff in our truck that it's a done deal and Mullen will be heading to Gainesville. Whoever inherits that Mississippi State team is going to have a nice roster to take over. That won't be a rebuilding job like most schools when you have a new coach. Yeah, he got a roll in there and start Vegas, didn't he? Still just Alexander. Couldn't make it back-to-back -back buckets. Which to me, you'll look at this game and say, okay, wh where did Kentucky grow on the season? One of the biggest things to me, we didn't learn a whole lot new about the players. Gildas Alexander had a really good night, Knox. But where they grew was, you look at the past two games, Troy, Fort Wayne. They started playing the scoreboard a little bit when they got up big. Right now, they have been able to keep their foot on the gas against this team. A few slip-ups here and there, but for the most part, they've kept their focus. It was a 17-point lead at the break. It's now 33. And speaking of three, there's a three from Wenyon Gabriel, his first points of the night. And it's not really a question of piling it on. Coach Cal would put all his subs on the floor if he could right now with the game well in hand. But he needs to teach these young freshmen how to play for lack of a better term, how to run through the finish line, not just to the finish line. He's been notorious for really not putting walk-ons and guys at the end of the bench on until the last minute or so. And these are great practice reps for the team. It's not about a lead not being safe. It's about reps. 17 for P.J. Washington. And they're knocking on the door of the century mark here inside Rupp Arena. on one, the lob, and the finish by Knox. <laughs> 25 for number five, Kevin Knox. This is their first time getting over the century mark in the last 30 games. They did it January 3rd against Texas A&M last. Washington. Have guys 6'7, 240 run the floor like that? 
It is a scary thing to witness if you are the opposition and you're looking forward to facing these Wildcats. 101, 63, 346 to go. Kentucky up by 38 with 346 to go. When your team scores 101 points, you don't just have one All-State good hands play, you have multiple All-State good hands plays, and it's points in the paint where the Cats have been most dominant tonight. No question, the good hands package, whether it was against the zone, Diallo getting into the ninth of the defense, or running the court, Washington putting it down, and then this might be the highlight of the night, Diallo, man. Mamadou Diallo with 19, Kevin Knox leading all scorers with 25, but again, 56 points out of those 101 so far scored inside the painted area, whether that's on a transition fast break or just working the ball into the post. John Calipari has preached that to his team in practice day after day, and tonight they have followed through on those marching orders. I think there's teams that's gonna learn a lesson from UIC's game plan. You can't take quick shots. You can't run with this Kentucky team if you don't have the personnel to get back quick and match up. And many times that can be, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to shoot it and play our game. But to me, if I'm a coach, I'm saying, but I'm only having one guy crash the offense rebound. You other four, get the heck back. Washington comes up short on both free throws. As we mentioned, the game schedule lightens up a little bit as we turn the page to the month of December for these cats. They will host Harvard on ESPN at 3.30 on December 2nd, then have a week off and they'll be taking on Monmouth on uh, ESPNU at noon. Richards got pushed in the back and he'll go to the line and shoot too. That's amazing, man. I mean, you watch that play, and UIC does everything you're supposed to do. They know there's going to be a guy rolling. They bring the help defender over. There are two guys on the player green is throwing its two, and you still can't stop it. That's how talented this team is. Jordan Blount's night is over. He has his fifth foul collected, and now if you hear the crowd behind us, putting their hands together, it's because Brad Calipari has entered the game number 12. And earlier this season in their first six games, Coach Cal wants his son to get in, sometimes in the first half, because he might be the best shooter on this team. When you look at a potential weakness for him, as we discussed, three-point shooting, you get a guy like Calipari out there on the wing, even if he's not taking a shot, the other team's got to play him. And that opens up driving lanes if teams choose to sink they have to respect a shooter out there on the perimeter like Calipari. And, and man, I mean, when you can get the same type of applause as the Chick-fil-A promo with the free chicken, I mean, man, you're a real star on this campus. Both those free throws good by Nick Richards, giving him 11, and that makes six Kentucky Wildcats in double figures. 103-65 coming up on three minutes to go. talked so much about the strengths of this Cats team. It's been on display tonight, their interior play, the fact that they can share the basketball like they have and have so many players in double-figure scoring. If there was one weakness that you would like to see them work on over the next month before we head into conference play in the SEC, what would that be? Consistent decision-making from the point guard spot. And I think we've seen Gilders Alexander play well tonight, quite a green. A lot of confidence in him. He's going to be a star, already is a star. But if he can learn how to run the team, and this is where it's a challenge as a Kentucky player, and it's a good problem to have. Look, when I was at Tennessee, if I came in as a freshman and I had his stat line with four turnovers, I'd be thrilled to death and nobody would be talking about my turnovers. But this is Kentucky. The expectations, the bar is as high as it gets, and you can't hide behind a few poor decisions. But on the flip side of that, you want that as a player, a program that's gonna hold you accountable, possession in, possession out. And so uh, I'm really interested to watch the growth of this team and how it's attached to the hip of the point guard play, specifically Claude Green. Claude Green on the bench right now, but he came in and very boldly and bravely stated his goal was to be the best defensive player in the SEC. He wanted to do what Tyler Eulis did a couple of years ago, who won SEC Player of the Year and Defensive Player of the Year. A terrific point and a terrific goal for Green. 
So many people talk about the high IQ of Tyler Ewis. He always made the right decision, made the right shot. But as you said, he was the best defender in the SEC. They might have the second youngest roster in the NCAA, but according to Ken Pop, they are the least experienced team in NCAA Division I basketball. And you can go back to the last 11 years that Ken Pomeroy has even tracked that stat. There is no team least, less experienced than this Wildcats team that we're witnessing right now. And they're going to continue to gain experience. They schedule hard. They schedule tough. They get everybody's best shot, all the things we know, to where come March, these freshmen are hardly freshmen anymore. But the difference in this year's team versus other young teams of the Cats is they don't have a guy like Darius Miller who's been there for four years, you know? And so what, who do they have from a veteran standpoint to complement that growth? And right now, they just don't have it. And also give credit to the terrific coaching staff that Coach Callis had by his side for a number of years now. Kenny Payne, the associate head coach. Of course, Tony Barbie, who was with him all the way back in his UMass days and is now one of his trusted advisors. Bill Justice is on that staff. John Robick is also there. And this is a, a team that has definite roles that they play. But it all funnels up to the top. And as we mentioned earlier in the show, John Calipari is the singular voice in this program. A well -oiled machine, man. And I was talking to D. Brown on the UIC staff, who we highlighted earlier, the famous D. Brown from his Illinois days, professional career as well, now coaching. And he said, you know, a lot of people say this might not be Calipari's most talented class, but people forget who's coaching him. It's a Hall of Fame coach. I don't care if he's got three guys that are going picks one through 10 or 10 through 20. When you got Cal as your coach and that staff, he's going to get the most out of it. Some really nice compliment and kind words from the opposing team. Tons of respect for this guy. Brendan Gabriel checks out, and Dylan Pulliam checks in, as did Johnny David last time out. So Coach Cal clearing the bench with under two minutes to go, and the game well in hand, 105 points for this Kentucky team. This is two nights after we witnessed an Auburn team score, what, 114 points? <laughs> Now those guys, they can score with anybody in the country. I'm not sure if they can defend with anybody in the country yet. They're, they're still learning the importance of that. But if there's a squad out there that is going to try to outrun you, outscore you, it's the Auburn Tigers. And they've got a plethora of shooters. We saw Mustafa Heron go off for 30 plus points. This is a league, and I've heard a lot of people say this. I'm interesting to hear, interested to hear what you think. Some people are still hedging, saying this is the best conference in basketball, but they're saying, undoubtedly it's the most exciting conference in basketball it's because it's had time to rebuild i mean it was exciting when rick barnes got hired when bruce pearl got hired when avery johnson got hired ben howland but those guys couldn't work magic overnight they needed time and now they've got their players they've gotten time to rebuild and now they're ready to be one of the top teams in the country here's brad the crowd willing Brad Calipari to knock down that triple. I wish they knew that that makes them more nervous. Uh, you know, when you, when you get that behind you and everybody's waiting for you to shoot it, telling you shoot, 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 it only makes it a lower percentage look for you. And trust me when I tell you, you could attest to this. You go to any UK practice, you could count on one hand how many misses Brad Calipari has from three. If he gets in one of these games in the first half, you shouldn't hear anybody saying, oh, the coach is putting his kid in. This kid's earned it, and he's a threat, and he's the best shooter on the team. Blake Jones, no. Wingyard, yes. Under a minute to go. Matthews gets the floater to go. David had his pocket pick by Godwin Bowen, and he'll go to the line and shoot two. Well, feast week has been an absolute feast for the eyes if you're a college hoops fan. And the nightcaps are on the way. Missouri taking on West Virginia at 9.30 on ESPN2.
Washington State and San Diego State from the Wooden Legacy coming up at midnight on ESPN2. And then back-to-back PK-80 games on ESPN. First North Carolina and Michigan State. And then the one, I guess you call it the cherry on top. Number one Duke, number seven Florida. Mike White, whose father is the athletic director at Duke. This is round two for him. Last year, played him close. Duke came out on top. And I love how Kayvon Allen plays the game. I think he is maybe an underrated and under the radar type star in the SEC. They've got a number of transfers that have come in and made a huge impact. They've scored over 100 in every game they've played this year, except for one. Two plus points per game are the Florida Gators. Something tells me they won't drop the C note on my on Coach K's club. <laughs> Just taking a wild yeah, yeah. guess. <laughs> I could I could hop on board for that one. And the clock winds down on a thorough dominating performance by John Calipari's Kentucky Wildcats. They improved to six and one on the season with a 107-73 win over the UIC Flames. Balance scoring up and down this lineup. Kevin Knox leading the way with 25. Hamadou Diallo, a career high 19. Shea Gilgis Alexander had 14. And PJ Washington with 17. All of those are career highs for these baby cats. And that's what can happen. If you play the same way for 40 straight minutes, everybody can get theirs, <laughs> especially when you have this type of advantage over a team. If I'm Coach Kyle, I go in the locker room, not that he knows their career highs, but says, hey, raise your hand if you like getting career highs. Raise your hand if you like doing it all in the same game. This is what happens when you can give me 40 minutes of consistent effort. And Quade Green, although not a career high for him in points, really stuffed the stat sheet tonight. 12 points, six rebounds, four assists, and did not commit a turnover in the second half. Yeah, I thought he did a really nice job adjusting to what Coach Kyle acted, uh, or asked from him and got himself and his head back in the game despite Gilders Alexander playing well in the second half. Here's Coach Cal with Michaela. Coach, you told me you wanted to see a full 20 minutes from your guys in the second half. How would you assess their effort? Better. I thought we were efficient offensively. I thought we gave the ball up ahead when guys were ahead. We're still not scrambling defensively enough, but, you know, this is a young team. They're going to have Monday and Tuesday off. We don't play till Saturday. So we have Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Wow, we haven't had three days to practice. And then we don't play until the next Saturday. They'll be off Sunday. We go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hopefully people begin to say, all right, they're getting it. It's hard to do this without practice time. Well, good luck. Thanks, Coach. Thanks. Thanks, Michaela. Our final score once again, Kentucky 107, UIC 73. Coming up next, a replay of South Carolina taking on Clemson in college football. For Dane Bradshaw, Michaela Vernava, and our entire crew on the SEC Network, I'm Rich Hollenberg saying so long from Lexington. The Cats improved to 6-1 on the year.